All right. Welcome, people. This is exciting. We're glad you're here. And we are going to start on time today to just respect everybody's hour. And let me just arrange my window again, and we'll be good. Okay. So welcome. Um, my name is Ellen Mueller. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Um, welcome to our summer furniture and social practice conference. I'm going to start out with a visual description of myself in case we have anyone with low vision partic participating tonight. I am a late 30s white woman with brown hair, brown eyes. I'm sitting in a studio office space and I have a black t-shirt on. Um, so before we get going today, I want to start out with a land acknowledgement to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are occupying here in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, gathering here, we pay our respects to those elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but also via racist laws that have and continue to segregate all people. We honor those who live and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience. So if you'd like to learn more about land acknowledgements, um, please feel free to screenshot this slide um, and visit the websites that are listed there. You can um, visit the first website, native-land.ca, to find out what land you are on. And if you're interested in making your own land acknowledgement, you can uh, click on the second link, and that will take you to um, really great resources for doing that. So um, tonight's event is sponsored by the MCAT MFA program. Um, and if you are curious about us, um, we are, you can, go to our website mcad-mfa.com and learn more about our community which is a group of makers thinkers researchers and creative professionals working in a mentor-based interdisciplinary environment so check that out um, also we've got some technical notes um, to keep us on track tonight uh, uh, first and foremost, your audio will be muted tonight, and if you experience any difficulty with the technicalities, you can email us and we'll be there to support you. Um, feel free throughout the event to leave comments, questions, anything really in the chat, and we will select from those submissions um, to uh, at, at the end of the panel if there's time for that. So please do participate. We love that. Um, also, a recording of the webinar will be made available after the event, and that'll be posted on our website. So um, next, we want to thank all of our amazing um, people. <laughs> We've got Aaron Morin, if you want to wave, Aaron, um, who is co-organizer of this fantastic conference. Um, and then we also have wonderful staff here at MCAD, Seth Dalside, Kylie Van Node, Nikki Motocolum. And then tonight we are assisted by Pearl Davis, who is our live tech support. We're really lucky to have her. Um, also, thank you to our amazing sponsors. Tonight we have the American Craft Counselor Council. I keep saying counselor, it is not American Craft Council, um, Rockler, and the Furniture Society, along with Tandem Made. Shout out to Erin Morin, that's her company, um, Rippin and Blue Dot. So we wouldn't have been able to do this without them. So we're really, really grateful. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, tonight, we are joined by Annie Evelyn, Katie Hudnall, M Daniel Michalik, um, and Aaron Morin. Each one will be giving a three to five minute presentation so the audience can get a sense of each panelist's background and work. And then we'll move into some prepared questions for the panel. And hopefully, we'll have some time left and grab some QA from the audience. So, without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and hand this over to Annie. There it is. Okay. Um, my name is Annie Evelyn, and I will also start off with a description. Um, 
I am a newly turned 45 year old white woman with uh, blonde hair today, but it changes constantly. Um, I am wearing a navy blue tank top and I am sitting in my um, messy living room that hopefully you can't see uh, that it's messy in front of me. And um, I am just so thankful to be uh, invited um, to talk here tonight. It's such an honor to uh, be here with these amazing educators. Um, I am a furniture maker currently living in Bakersville, North Carolina, but I am soon to be moving to Smithville, Tennessee to begin um, a new tenure track teaching position in the wood department at Tennessee Tech University, which um, I'm very excited. And I will be um, working under Kim Kimberly Winkle there, who's the head of the department there. Um, I'm gonna tell you about myself by breaking things up into four categories. Um, teaching, collaboration, furniture, and community. And I'll just quickly go through that image is not there, but um, it was a picture of some students taking a class at Penland. Um, teaching has been a continuous part of my professional practice. I love teaching. You get to use your brain in a lot of different ways in one class. You have to jump from problem to problem, and you have the opportunity to get to know each student and help them figure out who they are and what they make. And that's um, what I really love about teaching. And I've taught a lot as an adjunct and a lot. Um, I've taught concentrations at Penland and workshops. And um, so I've been describing myself as the fun aunt who's like switching into the mom role next year. I'm very excited to go from, from fun aunt to uh, serious mom. So hopefully I can pull that off. A lot of my images are not showing and I'm really sorry, but um, another important part of my um, practice is collaboration. Um, and there's would be an image here of a poster of Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is a film that I worked on. Okay, all my images are not showing up. So, well, <laughs> okay. Well, there was a whole section there about collaboration and I have taught, um, put on events and actually taught events as at classes. I taught um, a table fights event at RISD and I taught a class at um, CCA last year that was called, um, the art of throwing a good party and making the furniture that goes with it. And then I've also put on uh, events in cities that I've lived in, New York, New York and New Orleans, um, but we'll just skip that. And, um, and then furniture. Um, and I always say that my furniture has taught me and still continues to teach me who I am as a person. So I'll just slip through all these pictures that aren't showing up for some reason. Uh, but okay, that one's showing up. <laughs> and, um, and then lastly, community, which is also not going to show up. But hey, Annie, um, Annie, is it okay if I interrupt for a second? Yes, please. Do you, do you want to take a second and see if you're able to fix it? And then we could jump on to Katie. Um, you know, I think it's not that you're okay. okay. I'm almost done. So it's okay. You know, these are just images of that would be of, um, me working with the community. Um, I've taught classes and acted as a mentor in my local communities. Um, I've taught continuing education classes. Um, and then in 2019, um, myself and a group of like-minded artists from Penland uh, started working on crafting the future. That's not gonna show up either, but you can go to our website at craftingthefuture.org and, and look at some of these pictures that I was gonna show you. But um, we are um, artists working together to provide equitable opportunities in the arts and it's a membership organization. So if you're looking around feeling like um, you want your community to be more diverse, then please join us in that effort. Um, and we send students to craft schools around the country and provide um, small grants. And we're starting an internship program and we've funded internships at, at craft schools already. And we're gonna start some direct student to artists or um, apprentice to artist uh, residencies. And then most recently in the um, community work, I collaborated with um, one of my best friends, Ellie Richards uh, for the Furniture Society leading the um, Craft for the Greater Good um, project that they do. And here's just a few shots of that, um, us meeting with the community and we led some community workshops um, of chair weaving. And <laughs> that's it, okay. Awesome. Sorry about the technical difficulties. 
no worries. No worries. We're in the Zoom universe. Anything can happen. You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next up, we've got Katie. Um, and I am hopefully not going to have technical difficulties in large part because I didn't prepare nearly as beautifully as Annie Evelyn did. Um, but shout out to Annie and to um, um, Crafting the Future. It's such an awesome, awesome thing and awesome artist. Um, so my name is Katie Hudnall. I, um, I now run the Wood Program at the University of Wisconsin in, at Madison. Um, and I've been here for a year. Uh, I'm newly tenured. Woot woot. Um, so that's great. And before that, I was at a really wonderful school in Indianapolis, Indiana called Heron School of Art um, and Design. And that is um, part of the IUPUI system. Um, really fantastic. And there I was in the furniture design program as a dual faculty member for seven years. And before that, I was at Murray State University for three years in a program that when I started was called Functional Art and I changed the name to wood um, because that's essentially what it was. And we were right next to metals and ceramics. So it just sort of made sense at that moment to change it to, to sort of reflect the material that we were working in. Um, and so, so that my teaching history is about, it's about a dozen years old. Um, my background in the arts is um, sort of, uh, I started off going to art school um, way, way back in uh, like 1997, um, thinking that I was gonna be an illustrator. And my hero at that point was like um, uh, Edward Gorey or Rube Goldberg. Um, those were kind of like my two biggies, comic book um, and illustration artists. And I've sort of carried that into the furniture world. I got inspired in a sculpture class. I started doing woodworking and I haven't really looked back. So I'll share my screen really quickly just so people can kind of see the work that I make now is really clearly inspired by, um, by that sort of Rube Goldberg um, um, kinetic movement um, and then also by woodworking. And I'm sort of interested in um, what we think of when we think of functional works. Um, like what function means and and also in sort of like the psychological um, aspects of, of furniture. So this is a piece I just finished a couple months ago. It's called Seed Keeper and I'll just show the video. Real quick. Can everybody see that? Yes, yeah. So the piece is, um, it houses 10 maple helicopters. And it's sort of this creature that contains these. I've been making these seed containers for a couple of years. I'm sort of interested in climate change and in thinking about climate change and in thinking about what we value um, and trying to make spaces that sort of talk about what I value um, in, in doing that. So I'll stop sharing. Amazing. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, we've got Daniel. Hello. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen. It's loading right now. Can you all see that? Yep. It looks great. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, my name is Daniel Mahalik. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And a uh, very, very big thank you to Ellen and Aaron for inviting me to join this amazing group of artists and craftspeople today. I'm super excited to be here. Um, thank you. Uh, I am a 48 year old white male uh, <laughs> with glasses and my lucky yellow cap and a blue shirt and I'm sitting in my studio here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so I, I put on this little intro my, um, my, my title at Parsons uh, just because the theme of tonight was about sort of teaching furniture design. So uh, I'm an assistant professor of product and industrial design at Parsons School of Design in New York City. Um, and I'm also a furniture and product designer 
Um, and for the past 15 years or so, I've used almost exclusively cork uh, in, in furniture. And it, it grew out of my thesis work when I was at the Rhode Island School of Design in the furniture design program. And it's just, it's a material which continues to enthrall me um, as I get deeper and deeper into it with its, its very human friendly quality, as well as its um, just amazing ecological benefits and, and examples of material health. Um, so I have a sabbatical coming up um, in the spring of 22. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Where I'll be a, a, a research fellow at Central St. Martin's um, in London in their uh, master's program in material futures. And so I'll be going back and forth to Portugal to get as deep as I can into the agricultural and industrial systems around cork um, and seeing how cork might actually prove itself to be a, a model for how humans might redefine their relationship to material extraction. Um, so I, I do design and make furniture, usually in, in small editions um, for clients, galleries, um, all sorts of things. And I've, and I've had this business for um, just about 15 years now. Um, but primarily, as with probably a lot of people in this room right now, the past year has just been utterly transformative. Um, on March 11th of 2020, I signed a, a contract on a project to develop and build about 25 pieces of furniture for the first um, Google store in New York City in collaboration with a, an architecture office named ReadyMade um, based here in New York. Um, and like I said, I, I agreed to the contract uh, the day before the entire city and the rest of the world shut down. Um, so simultaneously, my entire studio was dedicated to a single project. Um, and at the same time, my teaching uh, in, in tandem with that went completely remote as did everybody else's teaching. So those two things really formed this kind of incredible confluence of how you define your own practice and your own teaching through adversity and, and, and rapidly changing circumstance. Um, so these are just a few of the uh, environmental shots of the Google store, which opened um, just under a month ago. Um, and so this was, this was the only project I've been working on for the past year and a half. Um, and that actually was helpful in my teaching because I, I found ways that I could really connect that creative practice to the teaching. Um, so these, this is just a couple of, of photos from a class that I developed. Um, I, I was the director of product design at Parsons from 2015 to 2019. And in that time, I developed a, a few electives, including this one here called Designing Chairs. Um, and this is from the, the 2019 version, the last one we did in, per, in person. Um, and I found that as a way to allow students to really experiment with material and technique to help define their own personal individual design processes through the chair as a kind of conduit or a blank slate. Um, and there was the assumption at that time that it would be a very hands-on, very construction-based uh, advanced technical class. Um, and so it was only open to juniors and seniors and graduate students, um, people with, with more advanced skills in making. And then I had to figure out how to teach the class uh, on, online and in a remote situation in the fall of 2020. And um, that was amazing. It actually worked out incredibly well and totally expanded my definition of what it means to teach furniture design and, and what it means to design a chair. Um, when students are in you know, Sweden or Taiwan or New Zealand and we're all in the same room virtually together. Um, so a lot of it obviously was screen-based, it was decentralized, students were working either in their own apartments or their own homes or maybe their own garage workshops. And I found that in no way did it actually sacrifice the hands-on materiality of it, it just kind of expanded it out. Um, so those are just a few examples of my own practice and my own teaching, so thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Daniel, that's great. And then certainly, Last but not least is Aaron Warren. Pretty humbled to be here with uh, Annie, Katie, and Daniel. So uh, thank you. So here, let me see. Is that showing up? 
Yes, it is. Okay. Good. That was, was like so strange. Um, anyway, uh, hi, I'm Erin Morin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a mid-30s white woman sitting in my home office slash storage room in Golden Valley, Minnesota. Um, and I'm wearing glasses and a gray t-shirt. Um, if you hear any shrieks or anything, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old upstairs. Um, hopefully being um, entertained by their Hot Wheels tracks with, with dad up there. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be here and to have been part of planning this with Ellen. Um, I'm an artist, designer, builder, um, business owner, mother, uh, to name a few. And um, I've been uh, teaching um, as adjunct faculty at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design for the past probably five-ish years, I think. Um, uh, one to two classes as a semester. Uh, this last year, however, um, pandemic year, um, I had the opportunity, I keep saying that, uh, to um, be the full-time uh, professor in furniture design. Um, uh, uh, so I'm excited to talk with other people kind of about, about that experience. Um, it really solidified a lot of, um, some of my, you know, my thoughts and feelings about where my passions lie in making and, um, and just, and working with people and, and how much I really love teaching and working with students. Um, so I'll first show a couple images of my own work. And then um, I do have quite a few images of some of my student work because that's really been um, kind of the, the crux of my inspiration lately. Um, uh, so yeah, a, a couple things uh, of my work at Tandem Made. So um, I've had, I co-own the company Tandem Made with my husband um, and we design and build um, custom furniture and then production ready kind of products and things um, and have been for the past 10 years. That said, kind of teaching and mo moving into that over this past year and then having young ones at home has changed uh, the, the trajectory of all of that kind of work, but we still have the studio rolling. Our garage downstairs is a, is a shop um, that's in the works. Um, so uh, yeah, I, there's always things that are that are changing and I'm, and I'm good with that. So um, yeah, just a couple pieces of, of different work. We, I, we really love working with wood and metal and combining wood and metal. So um, that's, a, I think a, a pretty special thing that um, I learned at MCAD as a student and also that I teach at MCAD is just really the combining of those materials and really exploring a lot of different materials as well. Um, and okay, so yeah, that's some of my own personal work um, and I'll kind of get into the fun stuff, which <laughs> is a lot of the student work that, that's been happening. So um, over the past five years, I've been teaching in the 3D Foundations um, program. So the class that all students take uh, when entering MCAD, regardless of major, regardless of uh, desire to get into the shop um, and we get them in there and play and it's all, I've, I've really realized in the, through teaching this how my how important play is in making and um, really e exploring and having a safe welcoming um, fun spaces to just explore and how important that is to learning um, and this, the students have really um, arrived I think with that with that mindset and been like okay yeah we can just you know bend some wood and weld some things and sure I guess make a cat tree <laughs> um, but <laughs> you know there's always, there's always going to be those projects um, so yeah I'll, I'll kind of go, go through a couple of these things um, I've also been teaching um, uh, some classes called materials and techniques which is um, going into more advanced um, wood and metal working, um, advanced material classes, senior project, lighting and accessories. I think um, uh, uh, over these semesters, I have rarely taught the same class more than once, <laughs> um, but that's been uh, really fun. Um, and again, uh, forced me to learn and explore um, new and different materials and respond to what students want to. Um, if they want to do something new and funky, I'm like, yeah, sure, let's try it. <laughs> um, yeah, which has been cool. So um, a couple different student work pieces um, with uh, the exploratory nature of, of my teaching. I really um, 
really encourage students to um, to to play, I guess. And I had said that earlier, but um, and to really push push the boundaries of of function of um, you know, is it actually going to work? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I've noticed that um, you know often students want um, the answer and there isn't an answer and i'm sure annie daniel and um katie can all agree that you know it's difficult when there's a lot of different answers and new answers are being invented all of the time right so um trying to trying to teach that and stuff so i guess some of these questions that we'll be discussing later will um really bring those um to uh, to head as well but um yeah just a few more little things but uh, yeah, these are from last fall. We, uh, we were doing a fiberglass project. So students really having a lot of fun, you know, and just seeing how vastly different you can push the materials. Some lighting pieces. Um, and then this is from a senior project class uh, that, that I taught. So um, kind of a, a thesis project that, that a student worked on for an entire semester and um, just so phenomenal to see it all come together. Um, and then lastly, uh, at the, at, this was um, just from a few months ago, um, our last day, uh, the first time um, our whole class actually got together and we had an outdoor critique um, at the end of our pandemic online school of learning and teaching furniture design um everyone made some adirondack chairs and we sat out on the lawn and took a, a nice family photo <laughs> of that um so yeah but i i'll stop sharing my screen now um and look forward to to talking with the rest of you guys awesome excellent all right well i'm gonna dive into these questions because they are big they are Juicy, <laughs> these are some fun questions. So our first question is, what does it mean to teach furniture design? And I'd like to just open it up. If, if you wanna jump in, if you have a good answer ready at the, at the wings, pull it out. <laughs> should, should, I, does, is somebody, should, I, should I go? Go is for it, Annie, solid? do it, take I mean, it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think like the main thing is, you know, helping them find themselves and express themselves. And like, you know, there isn't a blanket thing to teach. It's helping each student figure out what what are the questions they need to ask themselves. And that's my that would be my number one. Excellent. Um, I would. I would just add that like in thinking about the the products that are available in the world and like whether or not you can see yourself in them I think that there's something really remarkable about giving people a sense of agency like I'm five foot three. Oh, I'm a white woman i'm 43 <laughs> I have all blonde hair that's very weird looking glasses studio behind me red shirt um, but like. Um, every chair that I sit in puts my legs to sleep. So like just even, even explaining to students that there isn't a chair height that is perfect for everyone, that they can make that decision, that it could be 16 inches for some, 18 for others. You know, it could be outrageous if you want it to be, like that you get to have some agency in the world that you make around you is um, a pretty incredible part of furniture design. Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I I, I think that ex, um, to Katie's point, like expanding the the view of what furniture means and what the potential of furniture is um, is extraordinarily important. And one of the things we did with the the chair elective this year when we were teaching remotely was um, not to make it just an advanced level class. And all are welcome from any discipline from any level. It might not have been open to first years because they have like a whole busy schedule, but sophomore, junior, senior, graduate students. And um, and it was the most amazing body of work that the students uh, created uh, just because of the, the kind of welcoming atmosphere of like, first of all, the world doesn't need any more chairs. We're, we're good on that. Like we have enough. 
And Touch your mouth, Daniel Mihalik. <laughs> no, it's true. It's we don't. We're fine. <laughs> and I, I think that the chances are pretty small that that any of us are really going to like create a truly innovative chair from the standpoint of like ergonomics or performance. But if we look at the things that we really need to tackle, um, climate emergency, social justice issues, issues around material um, waste, labor practice, like a chair is an open, and is, an, uh, is, is a conduit. It's a blank slate for you to, to bring your sort of approach to solving problems um, into a physical form. And so, yeah, I guess it's just like opening it up to as many people and as, as many diverse voices as possible. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. Erin, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think something that I've really thought about um, over these past few nights, actually, um, in particular, is just uh, that furniture at, or the, at the idea of furniture being a tool to do a lot of different things, right? So by teaching it, by thinking about design, um, by thinking about ergonomics, by thinking about placement. Um, and I think all of those things really go back uh, to what I think teaching furniture design is um, and just how multifaceted that the teaching of it is. Um, and like, you know, the importance of looking at our surroundings, investigating, um, different materials, studying the history um, so we know what has been made um, and also understanding, yes, we can study that and remake it because we're learning through that process, but also, okay, if you're gonna make something, make it better, right? Um, and also the, the ideas of, of challenging, of exploring, taking risks. Um, and, then it, and then it kind of goes back to like this balance then of teaching craft and technique and then teaching design. And then, you know, it just builds and builds and builds. And I think I often find in, in teaching and working with students how overwhelming that maybe gets for them. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys feel that same way too. Um, that there are a lot of layers and they're not going to reach perfection right now. And then I have to tell them like, oh yeah, I'm still like learning how to do some of that stuff or I've never done a joint like that, but we can try it. Sure. Let's figure it out. Cause, um, so yeah, I don't know. I started to kind of ramble a little bit, but <laughs> a lot of things in teaching furniture design. So I liked hearing your, all of your answers as well. Absolutely. And I'm going to bounce over to the chat because we had one really nice comment from Wu um, who says, love everyone's work. And then Susan dropped a really great question in the chat. And Susan asks, what were the biggest challenges of teaching furniture virtually regarding the vast differences in tools and space per each student? I know that one's kind of sprung on you. So if you don't have an answer right now, you know, okay actually i found that to be incredibly energizing uh the fact that i had some students who had access to like a full wood shop and then you know like in, in their parents garage or something like that or other students who were in like a 300 square foot apartment and didn't have any access to anything um it so we did a lot of work um using like technology, I mean, things like Miro, right? We use like these kind of collaborative software to help um, work collaboratively, but it was more about the fact that, okay, if we're gonna mediate all of the teaching through a screen, then maybe we should actually be looking at the chair from the perspective of the image of the chair, of a chair as an image of an object and not as like a really fine piece of crafted furniture. So let's start at the baseline of understanding what we mean when we visually communicate chairs. And now let's move into really weird, messy mock-ups that we can actually put our bodies into, whether they're made from cardboard or, um, you know, egg cartons or two by fours or whatever. So like, there is a lot to be gained and a lot of community building to be, to be had within a class, even without any access to tools and materials. And then if, if everyone is knowing that there's equal value, whether you have access to a wood shop or not, it, it almost, makes that question not so much of an obstacle as as like a, a, a springboard. That sounds fantastic. 
yeah, we approached it a little bit differently. I actually taught during the pandemic, both at Heron and then here at Heron, we stopped mid semester. And so um, we ended up doing uh, mock-ups and we mostly used food actually to build our, our models, um, lots and lots of carrot chairs and <laughs> Um, joinery at because like the only workspace that's in every apartment is a kitchen right so like that became the workspace for our students there and then here I was able to get um, toolkits to our students so every student I dropped off buckets of tools to every student in the in the city Madison is small so it made it sort of doable um, and I had a similar feeling. So we are called Wood, that's the program. So my goal was less to teach sort of furniture design this time around, but, but more to sort of focus on the things that sometimes get left behind when you have access to a huge industrial shop, which is hand skills. Um, and I feel kind of wild talking about building hand skills for students, because that's not the kind of programming I came through, but it was, it was actually really fruitful for our students. We all focused on small stuff. Everyone's toolkit came with a list of tools and a cost. They all cost $225. So the students understood at the end of their time with their bucket that for $225, they could keep going with these with this work. And a lot of them bought some or all of those, of those tools themselves after they returned the bucket that, you know, of our tools, which was great. I'm still getting pictures from students of small pieces that they're making. So they all made a small um, elevated horizontal plane and they all made um, some carvings. So for us, it was really valuable. It was a good reminder to me to focus on those smaller hand tools because those are accessible for people who have very little space, very little budget. Um, a lot of my students are sharing spaces with elderly or with kids um, and they couldn't build big things. Um, so it was really, that was really kind of a great reminder for me that that like, um, there's so many different ways, there's so many different paths forward. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I think it really highlighted um, just how, how important the creative problem solving is that we have to do. And um, we're doing it anyway. And even when we're in person in the classroom, but now it's like, oh, okay, well, yes, this it even just like really points out to students how there's so many different ways that things can be done. Um, I think that the biggest challenge of teaching during the pandemic, though, was when students would be making something and we would be on the computer and they would like hold up their something and they're like, well, why doesn't this work? And then you just like, want to just grab it and I'm just like so tactile um that like that was a challenge so then I'm like drawing on a little whiteboard and trying to kind of troubleshoot and so I ended up you know masking and going into the school sometimes <laughs> to try and kind of figure that stuff out but you know a lot gets lost in translation then too um because I have so many students that really wanted to be hands-on doing things um that like through a computer screen you know they can hide a little bit more than you can in a classroom, right? I don't know if you guys found that. Um, whereas usually you can just go through the studios and find them and be like, you're not doing your work. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I see that there's some more questions and stuff happening in the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to pop in about that last one. No, I didn't want to comment on that, but I just did want to say as a person who wasn't teaching at a university and was scheduled to teach in the craft school, you know, all of our classes just got canceled, um, you know, which was obviously extremely unfortunate, but, um, you know, the John and, or no, um, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say, a mystery organization reached in and paid for all of us to, um, <laughs> You know, that's just my guess because I, you know, I just like think of it out in my head, but I don't know who did it. Um, so I shouldn't say that, but it just like slipped out. Um, but a mystery organization paid for all of, uh, um, all of the faculty all the way up until I was scheduled to teach, um, you know, well after the first summer. And, you know, we, we all got our um, payment for that. And that was just such a huge, huge deal. I mean, when you count as an individual artist, when you count on these you know, separate gigs everywhere. It was huge to have, um, to have, have that payment come through. And, um, 
I was also fortunate enough to get to teach a class to the core um, instead of my, um, to the core at Penland, um, instead of my two-month concentration, I taught a two-week class, but that's, that was my, my whole teaching. Uh, Pen nice. Thanks, Annie. Um, that is, and, and interestingly, the, the comments questions, the questions that are popping up right now are sort of dovetail with our pre-prepared ones. So if it's okay with the panelists, I'm going to keep going down the chat if that's all right. Okay. Um, Joseph writes, really enjoyed the intros and seeing the amazing student work made remotely. It seems like some teach in an art or craft department and others in an industrial design environment. Is this a distinction without a difference? Is there one or the other that's a better fit for furniture? How does it change your approach to students? Do you feel as though you and your students can move freely between these different approaches. So I don't know if anybody has some thoughts and reflections. That was a um, series. <laughs> I, I kind of have a lot of, I was thinking about this question a lot because, um, uh, because I got an undergrad degree in sculpture. I have a graduate degree from Virginia Commonwealth University from their craft and material studies department in woodworking slash furniture design. I taught wood at Murray State, I taught furniture design at Heron, and I now I'm running the woodworking program. And um, and I think, at least from my perspective, what all of these programs do is they allow they allow different thinkers to find their way to furniture. Um, I don't. If I had started at a at a in, in an industrial pr design program, I would not have gone into furniture. It wouldn't have occurred to me. Um, but I found my way there sort of organically by starting in sculpture and wanting something um, that felt familiar. And I was really fascinated by, by illustrators like Edward Gorey, who always draw the furniture. Um, you know, so like, I think that there, it was my way of sort of creeping into a home. Um, and I think like in an, in a, in an art background, um, there's something about the psychology of a chair and Daniel sort of touched on this earlier. You know, in photography, they use furniture to talk about human beings, right? Like it's a, it's a stand-in for a human being. A chair, an empty chair is, a, is, is the absence of a person or it's the possibility of a person, right? And I think, um, that my students now in an art program really see that. Whereas somebody who is coming through an industrial design program um, is really thinking about the problem of sitting maybe to start with, right? And I think all of these things kind of feed into really interesting ways of thinking about like what amounts to an amazing prompt, which is like, how do you make, how do you make a space comfortable for a body essentially? Or how do you sort of define a space for a body. Um, and I, I think that like, furniture is such an amazing prompt, but I think, again, that like all of these different programs are, I love that they're all in different places, that they bring brains like mine to brains like Annie's or brains like Daniel's. I love that, that they all kind of feed us into one group where we all sit down and, and, and get curious together about this stuff. Because I think- No, and I, oh, did, I didn't wanna cut in, but. I just, you know, thinking this is like, you know, what my first thing is like helping the students find out who they are. You know, that's the biggest thing with furniture because there is, there's three pathways. There's craft, um, there's art and there's design. And it's like, you can be all three. And so it's like, when I like want to help the students, it's like some people just want to do the process. And that is like awesome. You know, they like want to do the joinery. They're in it for like, working with wood some people are like design i always think is like you're solving a problem like you know what's the most comfortable what's the most ergonomic is there a place you know it's like you're you're just solving a problem you know not only say just because i mean it's a huge you know brilliant amazing experience to do and then art is like a inside self-expression and they can they can all work in conjunction which is like you know how i describe what i do it's like i'm an artist who handcrafts my own designs because it's like at some point the design brain takes over and i'm just solving problems like it starts off with an idea but then i make everything and you know it's like people can go in all three or 
or in separate paths or whatever. And I just thought what Katie was saying, you know, really went home to what I like, what I mean when I say help them figure out who. They are. Awesome. I don't know if Aaron or Daniel, did you have any thoughts on that question? Um, so I remember when I first started teaching in the, we call it product design at Parsons. We have, we, we, we also have a, a MFA program in industrial design. It's the same thing. <clears throat> we just have different names. Um, but when I started teaching there, um, I had come from a graduate program that was very, very heavily based in technique and craft and material experimentation. And, and it was really weird because, and this actually goes to the second prepared question about balancing your own creative practice with teaching. Um, so in industrial design, there's like this very specific type of sketching that you have to be able to do. And, and you have to do stuff like user testing and, and like stakeholder interviews. And like, honestly, when I started teaching, I had no idea any of that stuff even existed. And then people like students were always questioning me on like, well, why can't you sketch? Like, you know, like mm -hmm. hot rod sketching with arrows and stuff like that. Like I can't, so it's only like, it's been 15, no, 10 years that I've been teaching at Parsons and only in like the last two years do I feel like, oh, okay, cool. I'm comfortable in this place. I'm not a faker. I'm not a phony. And, and so I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just think at the end of the day, like whether you make art or you design things or you engage in like high level craft, like you're trying to do two things. You're trying to engage in, in some degree of inquiry into the nature of the universe and you're trying to make the world a better place, right? Yeah. So whatever method you can find to get there and to accomplish those goals, even in a small way is gonna work well. And, and so it's kind of beautiful to be able to be like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know this thing that you think I'm supposed to know, but maybe I know something else. And so then it like connects students and their challenges with the faculty and some of the challenges they may be facing and it's all kind of the same ball of wax. Nice. Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, I think, it, yeah, there's three great, great minds giving answers to that. And I think, you know, just like the, the summary of it is really that uh, depending, there's so many different types of programs that you can take. And yeah, is it, you know, a two week residency or workshop, or is it a four year degree or a graduate degree or, you know, so many different ways and paths or a continuing education class, um, you know, so many different paths that you can take uh, that I think, uh, you know, just in investigating and kind of spending time to, to think about what, what your interest in are and then you'll you'll find a way because there's so many different options and opportunities um, to learn and to explore materials and tools and and to gain that confidence so nice Katie, uh, i just want to say one more thing before we move on is that katie said i don't know whether i would have done if i had to go into industrial design and i also went to RISD and the furniture undergrad furniture department hadn't didn't exist yet so i did actually go into industrial design first and um i cried every day and then um, when we had to design an object, I designed a cardboard box that held my emotions. <laughs> so that's what happens when you try to stick people with uh, art brains into a very heavily designed, like, you know, program. And then fortunately, my teacher was Lane Myers, who is a sculptor, a graphic designer, and just like uh, all around amazing oddball. And he just sat outside with me every day and petted my head and said, it's going to be okay. And then the furniture department opened and it was magical. That's an amazing story, Annie. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, I'm going to pop on to the next question in the chat here from Rob, um, who says, sorry to spring this, uh, this one on you all, but how do you balance skill building like learning joints versus thinking up a design and then teaching processes as and when they are necessary? Use carrots. Nice. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think that is a question that I ask myself every semester in every class that I teach and trying to, you know, reevaluate and evaluate um, students' individual needs and their own interests as well. Um, and really, 
probably overwhelming them every time I'm teaching a class like oh yeah there's this to remember and this and this and this and this and this and this and okay yep there's a lot there's a lot to do but you can do it <laughs> um so I haven't quite figured out the exact equation for how that works I don't know have have, have y'all figured that out yet <laughs> Um, I do in the early classes, it's a lot of skill building. Um, I always try to make sure that um, um, there's not just an opportunity, but there's sort of a requirement that they bring their own minds to it. Um, but, but there is more skill building and I actually do give, this is terrible, no one's ever gonna take my classes again, but I give a lot of quizzes on like what wood is and how it works. Um, machine safety, like some of those things, because, because I've just found that after 20 years of going through school where they take tests, my students will actually retain the things that I teach them if they know it's going to be tested, not in a real world scenario, but in a test, um, which is sometimes it's disappointing, but it's also like based directly in their training. So I totally understand that. Um, and then, you know, to Aaron's point, um, because there's so many safety considerations, my classes tend to be small. They tend to be 15 students or less. Um, sometimes they're 18, but usually 15 or fewer. And um, I, I try to make sure at the beginning of every class that I have a sense of what my students want to get. Um, and so if a student has a lot of ambitions and not a lot of time, um, we have a lot of conversations about making smaller objects, um, just knowing that that small sometimes allows them to hone in on details that a larger piece um, might not be possible. And I'm much better now at, uh, at sort of saying that project will cause you this many hours of heartache. <laughs> um, and when I started, I was not, I, I really hated the idea of ever injecting myself um, you know, over their own sort of desires or, or voice, especially as a woman, I think there's sort of this amount of training where it was like, no, that's their idea. Let them have their idea. And it was like, yeah, but you're going to carry that idea over the finish line with them. So, um, you know, or they're not going to be able to complete it and you have to recognize that. So like having those conversations really early and often and, and making sure that they know like, you know, what's possible. Yeah, and I just, the only thing I would add to this, what you guys have said, which is great, is that, you know, they go hand in hand if the student isn't invested in the idea and if the idea isn't theirs and they're not like really excited about it, they won't have the follow through. And the other thing that I do is, um, you know, a lot, of this, a lot of students with like really big ideas, you know, getting to the small minutia of like making something with really high level of craftsmanship can be you know a big challenge but it's like you need to have these things to express your big idea to me and it's not going to express that idea if it looks like this or you know whatever so it's like you've got to be able to and and even if you're like well my idea doesn't need that craftsmanship right now it's like you need to come out of this program or out of this class with the ability to make whatever you want you know not just you know so don't don't stifle yourself now even though you might not be interested and then the other thing as as a as an early woodworker who was not um naturally adept you know just keep sticking with it don't worry about it it's like your ideas are going to carry you through like you know a lot of people i know that were much better woodworkers and why are not still furniture makers because it's like to me it was like you know it was like more of a you know, you'll get through it it's like it doesn't matter if you're not the best at it don't don't beat yourself up because your dovetails have a gap or whatever <laughs> That's I, totally agree. Agree. I totally agree with annie on that one yeah as in the same boat and it, it speaks to also that this idea of like instilling in students a sense of exploration and risk while valuing and practicing craft. That was one of the questions that we were reflecting on before mm -hmm. this. And um, and I was thinking about like ex exploration and risk taking is for the students like a strategy skill or, or like a map making of your ideas of like experiment, experiment, experiment with material so that you can kind of get a sense of what your idea really is. 
But then I also do believe, I like truly believe in this idea that the hand and the brain are kind of one thing and that they each think in their own way. And so if you have this ability to, to make really great ideas by goofing around with material or just doing things in a really lo-fi way, then when you do get your hands to be smarter, it's going to make those ideas somehow, I don't know, more meaningful or more sophisticated or something. So it is like if you can apply that level of craft to exploration and experimentation, it, it can't do anything but improve it in some way, I suppose. There was a really awesome um, lecture that Fo Wilson gave at the Furniture Society Conference in Milwaukee, maybe, the most recent one, I think. And she was talking about this and she said, um, she was working in her studio and she was thinking with her hands. And she said that phrase and then she looked at the whole audience and she said, because the hands are brains too. Yeah. And she went on with the lecture and I just like, everybody in the audience was like, oh. Yeah, I love Fo. she was my classmate. Oh, nice. Yeah, she had the studio right across from me. She's the best. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Um, I see our next question is from Gerald Ronning. Gerald, I see you. Thanks for being here the past few nights. Um, Gerald is also a luthier. And so he is, I'm sure this hand discussion is resonating with him. Um, hello and thanks. Speaking of kitchens in apartments, an off the wall question occurred to me regarding access. I delivered furniture in Minneapolis for several years and at the, at the time noted that few people on a budget were inclined to pay for delivery, which was one constraint of their choices to be sure. Moreover, when they did, I knew it would likely be a wild ride of wrestling large wooden boxes through narrow hallways and tight staircases, a ride that all too frequently ended in a frustrating compromise of some sort. Do any of you give thought in your teaching to how people will get furniture into their spaces, especially working with people's often smaller spaces? IKEA seems to have given this attention, but I think at some at some sacrifice in terms of design and materials among other things. So I'm sure this might be something that you all have pondered. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's something that we sort of teach naturally because, um, and I don't, again, I can't speak for everybody, but like the furniture students are the ones who are carrying the largest things into and back out of the classroom usually. And so we talk a lot about like, I get, I've given a project where students have to measure their car or their vehicle or the bus if they take it to figure out how they can move something to and from their home. Um, and I think that those are all really sort of like to understand those constraints is really important. And the hardest thing is like to pair those constraints with ambition instead of letting them sort of knock all of your ambition out of your sails, you know, like to, to find a way to say, this is like a great weird challenge. Let's do this and make it amazing. Instead of saying, let's compromise and compromise until it doesn't look like something you want anymore um, is the hardest thing, but, but for sure. Mm -hmm. I actually Thanks, find Katie. a challenge within that where students making furniture and being student furniture makers they're like well I need a coffee table so that's what I'm gonna make and I'm like well no like let's do something like more exciting or that's not really the prompt but they don't really care and they're just like well I need a shelf for my bathroom so that's what I'm gonna like try and weasel it into the project so I've been finding that a little bit more recently um, so that they, they do kind of have this awareness. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, the price of materials, the time that everything's going to take, they want it to be this thing, making furniture, the first furniture pieces that you're making don't always necessarily turn out great. Right. Um, but then you have this big thing in your life. So what do you do with it and how do you handle it and, and things like that? I mean, I just remember when I was in school, my mom one time was like, why don't you make jewelry? Because <laughs> so I was like bringing home another table. Like, hey, mom, I made this thing and I learned a lot, but this is a big thing now. So sorry, I digress. It's also a way of, of, of like teaching about consequence, you know, material consequence. Like I remember seeing this junior project years ago uh, at Parsons where this, this kid had tried to make these like concrete stools and it wasn't the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And they, he didn't even, like succeed in, in accomplishing what he set out to do. 
but he did manage to somehow create like 250 pounds of concrete. And then that concrete's gonna be around forever now. Like, I'm sorry, but that crappy idea that you had that was kind of half baked and you didn't even work that hard on is now <laughs> gonna be sitting in a dumpster outside. So like, that's unethical, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, like there's there's something to be said for like being mindful of how much space in the world all of this material that we're manipulating takes up. But don't you think they have to, and I totally understand that, and I actually had an experience, I'm sure there's a piece of concrete sitting outside of MCAD right now from a class that can be moved, um, but that they need to learn and ex use the materials to be better designers. Oh, man. I know I'm it's a challenge time. that I have all the time. Conundrum. It's a real conundrum. Mm -hmm. As a person that has some of those very crappy concrete pieces out in the world for myself, <laughs> <You're not crappy. laughs> I would say yes, they're necessary for my improvement. <laughs> I'm thinking about, um, you know, like one of the things that I've really loved as a, an artist and an educator is that I have gotten to visit so many different programs around the country. And at some point, Barbara Holmes invited me um, out to California to um, CCA to um, work with her students um, just for a couple of days. And they were in the middle of an incredible assignment that she had given that was based on the Martino Gamper 100 Chairs um, project that he had done. He's an artist. Um, and he made 100 chairs out of recycled chairs, essentially. And so she um, sort of encouraged her students to go out in um, a place that was really easy to find, um, you know, chairs that have been kicked to the curb and bring all of those parts back. And then they had to reinvent a piece of furniture. It didn't have to be a chair, I don't think, um, but from those parts. So she built a recycling uh, project into, um, into her, her project. You have to be careful with that. I only use reclaimed materials in my in my world. And I have to be a little bit carry, uh, careful, especially in the Midwest because there's lead paint Yep. on so much stuff here right so just like from a pure like health standpoint i have to be a little bit careful about my dumpster diving but um so long as you sort of explain those to students i think you can build the sort of ethical into uh, material gathering awesome i'm gonna ask panelists do you mind if we do one last quick question because i feel like this one's fast it's like a standard interview question which is how do you all balance your studio practice while and your teaching practice? Any advice? Oh, I thought you all would jump at this one. You have it in your back pocket, right? <laughs> we all have the answers. <laughs> I had a really hard time with it for a, a, for a long time, to be honest. Really hard, like, because I wasn't super secure about my own practice and I felt like a lot has changed in the past year and a half in terms of the structures of authority, perhaps, for lack of a better word. And I, I thought that as a teacher, I had to have some sort of degree of authority, which I didn't really feel inside that I had. And then I realized at a certain point, well, okay, maybe I'm a little bit more comfortable in it now, but at the same time, like any degree of vulnerability I have in my own practice is a vulnerability that's similar to what students have in, in their in, in, in the challenge they have in learning. So that's a means of connection between students. That, that, that's, a, that's a means of trust between students and instructor that builds empathy between the student and the instructor. And once you build the empathy, then you can communicate clearly. So I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out, but it's, uh, it's a good thing like to know that nobody's ever like perfected their practice. And that level of imperfection is a, is a benefit in teaching, I think. Nice. Anyone else want to put their two cents in on that question of balance? That's a really beautiful answer, actually. And I think it's something I came to a few years ago. And I, um, I will say that I don't balance my life particularly well. Um, I am four years sober. And so um, since I got sober, uh, I have really focused on my teaching and my art practice and very little else except for my family. Um, and um, 
And that has been incredibly valuable. So, I, I mean, I guess what I would say is that teaching and my art practice carried me through some of the worst time in my life um, and gave me sort of purpose. Um, there's something to do every day, which has been incredibly valuable. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't regret that, like I've sort of sunk so much time into all of this. I feel more whole than I have in a long time, but um, it is not, it is not easy for everyone. And for people who have kids, families, it's, it's, um, it's harder. And I don't think it's equitable yet, especially for women who have children. Mm -hmm. Not fair yet. Thanks for that, Kitty. It's such a good point. I just was like not answering this because I have been teaching in craft schools and as an adjunct and I just felt like that is a question for full-time faculty. So that's why I kept quiet. Fair point, Annie. Right now, everything's been great. I just go teach and then I go back and then uh, next year, I'll tell you in a year how it goes. Oh, just wait. Hey, that sounds lovely, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, that just like shows that there's a lot of different ways that, that there mm -hmm. is balance. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll just keep my, my answer to this brief um, in that I just really lean into the fact that there's a season for everything. And I've had my time where I've like really been able to be in the studio till like two in the morning. And that's not my time right now. That's not what I am able to do. Um, so, you know, my own personal practice has been more production based on small things that I've already been making. And then it's like making multiples of that. Um, whereas like making these big grand um, gestural pieces of furniture is, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a backlog that I, that I'm wanting to make. Um, but I, I know that I'm not able to do that at this moment, but the season will come again that I'm able to do that. Um, so I'm really just kind of like embracing that and riding the change of it. Um, and really taking so much inspiration from my students and my teaching. I mean, I think that that has like creatively filled me up um, in so many more immense ways than I ever really thought could. Um, and uh, and learning a lot from them and from the, the troubleshooting that I'm doing with them as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I got. Amazing. <laughs> that's such a good note to end on. Thank you everybody so much for your patience with this. Um, we went over by a few minutes, but I, I think it was worth it. Thank you all. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Have a beautiful evening, everyone. See Bye. you Thursday and Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Annie and Daniel.